for the effervescence, the ebullience, the exciting bundle of energy who we call, and God calls, Reverend Dr. Sonia. <laughs> Welcome her, please. Thank you, Reverend Mike. You are and he left out the, the, the diminutive this time, but uh, I'll take it. <laughs> good morning, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living in Kingston, Jamaica. And guess what? We are also welcoming those who are with us on the World Wide Web. Okay, so this, I was going to say, I love this time of the year. But I find myself saying that for every time of the year, so I'm just, just going to give up and just say, I love every year and every time of the year, don't you? There's something, you know, although we're in a tropical country and people say, oh, they miss the snow, they miss the autumn. There, if you are perceptive, there are some subtle changes that's always taking place on God's planet, even here, and I like it. This morning, I have captioned my talk, Guard Your Heart with All Diligence. It's Lent, and Lent is a season of spiritual growth dedicated to affirming and focusing on spiritual growth, although we do that all the time. In conventional terms, it is a time of fasting. In metaphysical terms, it means abstaining from wrong thinking. It means engaging in mental discipline which establishes us in the consciousness of oneness with the Father, God's universal principle. We use this time to become so certain of our relationship with God. In other words, we come to a closer walk with God. We come to a certainty as never before. We are in fact a point where God shows up. I had said to myself, you know, I wanted to do something quite unique in metaphysical terms as my recognition of this 40 day period we call Lent. And so I, I have some affirmations, one for each day of a week, which I had intended, and I still intend, to use these affirmations and then recycle it every week so that I will have seven times four and a little broader for this month. And some, but then a lesson came to me quite out of the blue, unexpectedly. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of a thing called chichi, chichi. Yeah, they, it's, it's, a, it's, it's something that eats wood. It's a, it's a termite that eats wood. No, many, well, not so many years ago, because I've been living in this house for a very long time. Not so many years ago, we laid down wood, right? Parking. And uh, we noticed that we started to see some of the, the um, wood popping up. So I didn't think anything of it. I said, maybe when we had an earthquake some time ago, you know, it would shake and maybe pop up. So um, then I noticed more, and then I noticed that the wood started to look a little strange. And somebody came to a house and they said, you don't know that you have Chichi. Chichi, no? Chichi. Yeah, I have a dog called Chichi <laughs> as well. <laughs> and uh, so we got somebody in to come and investigate, and sure as faith, we had it. No, I don't know if you know that you have to do the entire house. They go around and they bore holes even in the concrete. And he, he said he went outside and did something as well, right? But months, a couple months later, lo and behold, there comes the chichi again. Chichi, chichi again, right? And when the the Chichi Chaser came in, he said, <laughs> right? don't you know that the, 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 um, the, the trees carry, you know? He says that it's very difficult to get them out of the, the, um, 
the pear apple avocado, pear tree. So I said, why didn't you just tell me and you cut it down from the beginning? It, but my lesson in that is that like, yes, it was telling me, you can be living your best life, affirming and doing all your, that you need to do. And you sometimes you are unaware of the subtle things that are inside, deep inside, that needs to be worked on, right? Man, you know, I clean my house and everything, so I, I take responsibility for that. But they say that doesn't make any difference. Chichi is no respecter of persons. They come up out of the soil, and guess what? They were here long before we were here, and they'll probably be there long after as well. So, and the other thing that struck me is the race consciousness that bombards us, that sometimes we allow to feed into our own consciousness in the same way that environment around my house, including a, a, a very favored and favorite avocado tree. So something you have to make the sacrifice to get rid of in your own life distractions, things that's going to penetrate your consciousness, right? If you can take it, fine. If not, so that tree is going to go. But guess what also went? The no, the chichi, the chichi, yes. I to, we dug up all of the parquet floor. And with every dig, my heart went boop, boop, right. But guess what? I have lovely, beautiful ceramic tiles now. So take that into your life. I can't go into all the details because that's an add-on. But it struck me how important it is that in the process of life, we become aware, more conscious of what's going on around you. I was oblivious of this that was going on. And even when I did see it, I had my own interpretation. Pay attention to what's going on in your consciousness and also what your world is feeding back to you. And then address it in your consciousness. So I am happy with my new status of tiles, but I'm also most of all happy with the lessons that I'm learning that my environment is telling me. No, I, you know, everything in my life gives me a message. Everything I'm all, I've decided. And so I'm always, my mind is just so wide open to take everything in as a, as a message. And I invite you to do that if you haven't started doing that yet. It doesn't matter how obscure it might seem. So we know that this Lent, right, Although we, we have a, a way of focusing on our inner world, and so does everybody, but we focus a lot on our thought processes. And we, I took the, 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 the time to look at, a little time to look at Jesus. And it was apparent from the early stages of Jesus' ministry that he faced an internal contest of contending mental tendencies. If you read, the, the, the very short story of, of Jesus, um, very, because it is very short, which is in the, um, the, the New Testament, you will see that Jesus didn't, wasn't born, what did they say? Born, 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 born big, right? He had to go through many, many challenges and contending inner, inner dialogue. And, and even up to shortly before he did his big test, which is a crucifixion. And uh, even he, who stood at the pinnacle of human experience, had to allow himself to progress through the stages of consciousness to Christhood. So we need to be patient with ourselves, set ourselves out, and just be vigilant in our task not just to make demonstrations of, of, of various objects and things, but the most important demonstration is to proceed day by day with the consciousness that we are on the road to an ever unfolding understanding of our relationship with God. An early New Thought luminary, Annie Besant, says this, we are to learn to develop and then to use our developed thought power 
to quicken human evolution and to hasten our own progress. Thought power can only be increased by steady and persistent exercise. As literally and as truly as muscular development depends on the exercise of muscles we already possess, so does mental development depend on the exercise of the mind already ours." Unquote. And I found, um, just in time, an affirmation which touched me and reflects a little catalyst for our journey. And you can find your own, and, but I will ask you to share this with me. First, I'm going to read it through and then line by line. Within me is the all-powerful Christ spirit. It illumines me with the light and wisdom, with light and wisdom. It fills me with its healing current. Humanity is growing and I am growing with it. I am a center of peace and poise is my only reaction. So I'm going to read it line by line. Within me is the all-powerful Christ spirit. Within me is the all-powerful Christ spirit. It illumines me with, the light, with light and wisdom. It illumines me with the light and wisdom. It fills me with its healing current. It fills me with its healing current. Humanity is growing and I'm growing with it. Humanity is growing and I'm growing with it. I am a center of peace and poise is my only reaction. I am a center of peace and poise is my only reaction. You can remember that one, so sometimes it can come in handy, right? I am a center of peace and poise is my only reaction. You can prime the pump in the morning and sometimes when the road doesn't facilitate you feeling that way, just remember it. Um, there are a couple of, of lovely proverbs. You know, I've been visiting proverbs recently. It's really nice that I want to share with you too. This one from Proverbs 3. My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. Here is a promise as to what to expect when we rely on the way God works. We know it, how, it, how God works, and we discover how to work, how to let God work for us. And there's another one, Proverbs 3, 17 to 18. Blessed are those who find wisdom, those who gain understanding, for she is more precious than rubies, that is wisdom. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her hand. In her left hand are rich, in her right hand. Long life is in her right hand. In her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and her paths are peace. She's a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her, those who hold her. Hold fast to her, will be blessed. Isn't it the poetry of the Old Testament just beautiful? And then two more. Be made new in attitude of your minds and put on the new self created to be like God. That's Ephesians 4, verses 23 to 24. And then back to Proverbs. Guard thy heart with all diligence because out of it are the issues of life. Ooh, nice. In order to be happy and successful, it is important to avoid preoccupation with thoughts about the things we do not want to experience in our lives. Why? Because what we contemplate, we come to accept as real, and what we accept as real manifests in our lives. This is the law of cause and effect. What you desire strongly, contemplate, expect, or fear becomes the experience. The challenge becomes how to stop thinking about what we don't want and focus on what we want. One method in metaphysics is called denial. This is different from how we use that word in psychology. 
Now, in psychology, and it's very important for you to know the difference because it exists. Denial in psychology refers to a mental defense mechanism. The denial of psychology says that when faced with the facts of a potential painful situation, what do we do? The subconscious, we ignore it or we try to suppress it and the subconscious mind automatically rejects it at first that it is maybe just not real or too painful and what happens? You don't confront it. So we know that the facts, we can, the facts here are denied. So there is a problem and you say, oh no, I'm not having a problem. I am having runny nose fever and pain all over my body and you say, no, 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 no. I am not sick, right? Notice you know, I say, not sick, not well. Um, the person who takes this route is, tends to be paralyzed emotionally and functionally. I have seen at least three people who have become blind and physically paralyzed because they had painful situations in their lives which they refused to confront and just suppressed it ignored that the fact, initially ignored it, and then eventually forgot about it until it became manifest in their bodies. And you see, fear is the most common reason why some people deny the facts of the situation. But when we know the truth, as we know in the science of mind, we can confront fear. Now, the, the denial is just, in, in the science of mind, is different. It is just a change of direction of the flow of our thoughts away from negative to positive. A gentle flow. We accept, we look at it, we face it down squarely, and then we turn our attention to what we want, which is the opposite, right? So we use this denial and in a way that is an appropriate response. It is appropriate, different from the way that the denial of psychologists approaches it. It's not the psychologists, you know, in psychology. People who end up in, with psychologists use denial which says, mm -mm, no sir, nothing is happening, right? Is there anything about your life or my life whose virtue we are silently denying? Has our upbringing been so harsh or disadvantaged in our eyes? that we don't want to think about it or think about it in a way that's painful? Have we ever experienced abuse, physical or otherwise? Has our bodies and our trust been violated? I challenge us now to bring any of these thoughts that we may have repressed or put behind us into the light of a new consciousness, a new awareness. Deliberately look at it differently by means of the power of the transforming word of God's spirit in us. We can speak to it with confidence and then we turn our back on the darkness which it represents and turn our face towards the light. Emmett Fox says, take your problem and change your mind concerning it. That is your supply, the opposite. And keep it changed for a month and you'll be astonished. You'll, you'll want to keep it changed forever, but he says even a month. So if you have any situation that seemed to have been plaguing you initially, and you put it aside, but you're, you, are, you're, you have a sense of unease, or whenever you see things in the environment that reminds you, the uneasiness comes back. Take it for a moment, look at it, and ask yourself, what is the opposite of what I am feeling? And keep it that consciousness, keep that focus. And it says persistently try to keep it, don't, don't walk around stating it, but every time you come back to the old thing, you come back to that um, which you have decided. And you see, you will see, because you have to prove the law, you know, you have to prove it for yourself so that you can strengthen your faith in it. He says this is a simple promise, I say that to yourself, to make this commitment. Ernest Holmes says everyone should preserve portions of time for deep meditation, and I absolutely agree. The upper part of the mind must be kept in a listening attitude throughout the day, 
always, not necessarily in meditation only. And it's a listening attitude towards the infinite. By upper party, mind that part of you which knows and which you constantly remind yourself is that place in you, that part of you which expresses the nature of God. Remember, we are where God shows up. The goal of life is complete emancipation from all discord. And the price we all must pay, we have to pay it in spiritual for spiritual growth is in mental coins. We must be willing to change, to break the change which binds us to, bind us to habitual thinking, which gives credence to the false belief of the race. There are so many things that we, that happens around us, and maybe even happens to us, that affirms that, oh, because something never happened before, it can't happen. No, right? And because it happened before, it's likely to happen again, right? Because you have never done, you have never done something before, you can't do it, no. And this very subtle belief, it's very subtle because sometimes we mistake the lessons that we learn from our suffering as necessary that suffering is necessary. It is a mistake to think that suffering is necessary. When we suffer, we don't sit and beat up on ourselves. We learn the lessons, but we should be wary of becoming one that believes that we have to suffer in order to learn. There is no truth in that. That is part of the race consciousness which says so. And we ourselves, in changing that, must contribute to the race consciousness which liberates man, right? Humanity as a whole has, and I refer to, to the race consciousness, this is not individuals necessarily, because they're individuals who are highly enlightened, but humanity as a whole has lost its way along the spiritual path, despite many enlightened souls who have attempted to point the way to freedom. Jesus came along and by his example and teaching outlined clearly that humanity needed to do what humanity needed to do to be free of the bondage of ignorance. Unfortunately, instead of soaring to higher heights, and we are coming along, but we're not soaring yet, humanity has acted like a bird, reluctant to fly even after his cage is opened and is offered freedom. By clinging to the name of Jesus and largely ignoring his message, man has until now failed to soar as soar spiritually. Jesus' gift, that's not the only reason, but that's one of them. Jesus' gift to mankind was as the way sure, the one who demonstrated the divinity of man, the nascent power which lies within man. And in that sense, we look to Jesus in our temple as the liberator. On a personal level, we can all look to Jesus' example and to his very brief sermons for the clues to liberation. All the clues point to the inner life, to the mental state as a key which opens the door to true freedom, which is freedom from mental bondage. I have come, said Jesus, that he may have life and have it more abundantly. Which of us? would not choose a more abundant life. I invite you to go look at Jesus' words through your own consciousness and not through the socializations that we have had before, where we spend more time praising Jesus as if Jesus needed this than looking deeply into the message that Jesus had brought us. I suspect we have all felt stuck from time to time, stuck between wanting to change and fearing the change that we want. We want to change, but we are not certain that we want to give up what we have because we are not sure that what we think we want will turn out to be better than what we have. Yeah? Get it? Dr. Ernest Holmes advises us that in order to free ourselves of fear, we must let our minds dwell on love and protection until the images of fear dissipate. Whenever you are about to take on a change, just dwell on it, love, and know that that which loved so much that gave of itself as us and gave us the freedom to choose, 
dwell on that and know that that is what gives us the power and the protection to live our lives fearlessly. From time to time, people become trapped consciously or unconsciously in, full, in unfulfilling or stressful jobs and it and may be unrewarded or even distressing and abusive relationships. Yet it is my guess that few people consider themselves in bondage when they are in that situation. They say, I live in a free country, and I'm free to do what I please. They may say the freedom of which I speak is a freedom to choose what we will think about so and where we will place our attention and how we'll use our imagination so that we can experience the life that we want to experience. There's a tendency for us to fall back into whatever is our habitual pattern of thinking, even after we have moved away from particular experiences, we notice that it keeps coming back. And it is a pattern of thinking, however subtle, that is behind that experience that keeps coming back. It is therefore important that we cultivate habits of thinking which are liberating, evolutionary, and productive of good. Dr. Holmes said, if we wish greater freedom, and we are certain that we have complied with wisdom, love, and truth, then we must begin to think about greater freedom. So we can plant the idea of greater freedom. We already given it, you know, but we want to experience. So we can plant the idea in consciousness of experiencing greater freedom. Almost anything that we would want to do, freedom, there's an embodiment of freedom in it. We want to travel the world, there is freedom in it. We want to sleep in bed until 10 o'clock each morning and, and maybe go to work at 12. There's freedom in it. And you can think of so many things. Stop it. <laughs> but in order to think about greater freedom, yes, I said we have to cast out doubt and fear. Place the idea. Place the idea of greater freedom and let the universe enjoy itself, finding all manner of ways to, allow the, to bring this freedom into your life. We are at liberty to choose the life we wish by choosing the thoughts we think. That's where freedom lies. Some of these thoughts which we have, um, which we have habitually focused on, or which they're, they're in the background. Very often we are not conscious of it, you know. Sometimes we, because as I said before, we have chased them into the deeper recesses of our minds by refusing to confront them. And in order to deny their power and authority over them, we have to confront them. Instead, we repress them by consciously or unconsciously pretending they do not exist. And when these thoughts are out of our conscious awareness, they cannot be held up to the light of truth. And so we cannot place an opposing thought in there. We might not even be aware. So what we can do, it is good to have the generic thought, freedom. I am free to experience life in a beautiful and wonderful way as I wish. The pathway of life is strewed with contending ideas. Remember I pointed out that it is apparent from Jesus' very brief history that he had to be dealing with contending ideas. So do we, right? And you know, sometimes we say we want to do something and we feel that, okay, it's in our own mind, you know. And then we, we, we affirm that we are growing or we, have, we, can't, we, we, we congratulate ourselves in some way. And then you hear a little voice says, who do you think you are, Jesus? Or as, you know, one said, spiritually can't buy, buy bread. That's a common one. Spirituality can't buy bread when you, you say, I seek ye first the kingdom, and you know, all things are done to me. And then we have this common one when you're in combat with, with, with someone, instead of owning it and, and putting in the, 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 the affirmation, which is op opposite to what he experiences, you, you um, hear, don't let them step over you. Fight them for what you want, right? You don't want anybody to take advantage of you. I don't know, I'm sure you have heard this before. 
not to any of us in here, but you have heard it. Um, you know, we decide that I am going to demonstrate the things I want, and then I am going to focus on my spiritual growth, you notice. I'm going to give, when I get everything now, I can come to church more often, right? Because I don't have to stay up late working so that I have to sleep late on Sunday, the one day I get. And I, I will come to classes, you know, later on, right? Right now, I'm waiting, right? Look how many people in, the, in this church and look how many few people come to the classes. But I'm telling you, Man, the exponential spiritual growth that we who facilitate the classes are witnessing for the people who come. It's lovely to come to church, you know. But in class, you know, you wrangle your butt heads in a nice way. And then we, we, we exchange, you know. It's a collective, it's a collective um, exchange of ideas. Jesus the Master knew how important it was to his ascension to rid himself of certain beliefs that he had. And when we, we see the story of Jesus going into the wilderness, right? Jesus going into the wilderness to, to be tempted by the so-called devil, right? What is happening is Jesus had to step aside. He knew what he had to meet, so he had to go by himself, right? He didn't take this by disciples with him this time. As far as I know, another time he took two. He needed that time of solitude. Solitude is different from aloneness. Loneliness. It is aloneness, but it's not loneliness. And this so-called devil was really, in metaphysics, we think about it as the collective consciousness of the race belief, which is trying to say, no, you can't, or tell you other than what you know to be the truth. And all of us contend with that at some stage in our spiritual growth, as Jesus did. And he had many what they call tests, but in fact, these are things that came up. He had to do this to prepare himself for the big task that he had ahead. I suspect that we have all been stuck from time to time, stuck between wanting to change, we said, and fearing to change. But as I said, we need to dedicate alone time, right? Where we can sit and be still. And also, it is good to sit and be still with, I'm really in advertising mode today, sit and be still with a group of people. Why are just sitting and being still too, as we do in prayer power, eh? Right, okay? That's on Thursdays, right? And you can walk the labyrinth with people as well on first Wednesdays, right? So once we are confident in the use of the law, some people are confusing they, themselves by saying, you know, I, I don't feel confident that what I pray about I can get. Let's simplify it. Be confident that the law is a law, and when you have spoken it, it knows how to take your consciousness and convert it into that which believes whatever you need to become and to be and to feel in order to get that demonstration. The law knows how to do it. So simplify it and just, you believe in the law which says if I jump off the roof, I will reach the ground? No? Okay. Try it, okay? <laughs> you believe in the one which says, when I sit on the chair, it will hold me up. These chairs, not all chairs, right? But there are simple things. You believe that when you get out of bed, you walk, you step out, you don't give it a second thought. So all of these depend on laws of nature, and the universal law of the mind is the same way. It works, and it works like this. It works according to what you give it, consciously, or unconsciously and deliberately, what do you, when you give it deliberately, or if you just, you know, you're just moving around and, and experiencing life. No, so you know and you believe. So your work has to be with knowing that the law that we use, yes, there is a law that we use. 
works this way. You give it something to do, and he does it. And I love to share this. Um, I've said it over and over. My father-in-law, who was a deep, deep thinker and deep believer, he would say, but stop. If you give God something to do, and you start trying to make it happen yourself, right? Or tell him how to make it happen. He will say, go do it yourself, right? So what he basically was saying is state your word for what you really want. And what you want, believe it or not, is how you want to feel. We say it all the time, but a lot of times we don't plumb the depths of our consciousness to know what do we want to feel. Because if I want, say I want to have a beautiful car, and I may get a beautiful car, and every time I drive on the road, I, could, I would be better off walking because I could reach where I'm going quicker, right? You want perfect transportation, right? Ease and comfort and perfect transportation, and you will know what that means. That's a very obvious one, but there are some other things that we, we treat for. I implore you that to use the law by, because the law will give anything that you ask for. Use the law by stating what I want to feel, to experience, and to be. And you can do it for the big picture of your life. You can do it, I'm now working on it, that I want to feel that sense of the presence of God in everything, in everyone, every second, every minute, all the time of this lifetime and all lifetimes to come, right? That's what I'm working on, and I believe that the law, and I know for certain that the law will act upon it and respond. But guess what? It don't mean that I have to work it, or the law will impel me to work. It will give me experiences that will step on my corn and step on my heel that makes me keep moving. That's how it works. So I'm not saying that having done that, we sit and do nothing. You understand me? Okay. You understand me? Okay, okay, all right. So, in order to be happy and successful, it is important to avoid preoccupation with thoughts and things we do not want to experience in our lives. We said that before. We are at liberty to choose the life we wish and the thoughts we think which will lead us to the life that we want. And I just come back to our beloved Dr. Ernest Holmes, let me tell you, we are doing a little book, tiny little book, How to Use the Science of Mind. And it was originally for practitioners, but I think everybody in here is ready, who has been coming to this teaching, is ready for that little book. And I'm putting Reverend Anne on the spot by suggesting that she buys it, yes, orders it. It's a little book, you know. I have it in my bag and I walk with it. I have met it again. It's the third time I am actually doing it. And it's, it's, it's a big science of mind textbook. Everything is right in that little book. How to use a science of mind. And it is rich, it is simple, it is clear, but it is enough, it's concentrated, right? So you have to take your time and get a marker and read it line by line by line. And when you have embodied that, well, you take off like a rocket, I'm telling you, right? So I leave you with the words of Dr. Ernest Holmes. Every man must go into the garden of his own soul and lifting up his consciousness to the divine nature, find himself resurrected into a new life and a new light. Dearly beloved ones, may your desire to know God more intimately be continually rewarded with peace, love, wisdom, liberty, beauty, and a great authority over all the domains of your life and affairs. I know it for you. I know it for me. Let us know it together for each other. Namaste.